Dr. Glenn Cahoon sat down with us to talk about his work as a youth doctor, how he sets up his space for young people and the challenges he faces in the current system. I work as a GP in a youth health service. Uh, we are like a small branch in the Hora Whenua of the youth one-stop shop in Palmerston North and we call ourselves the Hora Whenua Youth Health Service or HIES just to give us that local flavour as you do in a small town. We see young people from the age of 10 to the day they turn 24. Doesn't cost them to come and see us. Not a week passes where a kid doesn't tell me about a way that they've been significantly hurt by a big person in their life. And, you know, this is not a big town. It's not a town too dissimilar from the rest of New Zealand. So if I multiply it out by all the small towns and the cities in New Zealand, I imagine that's quite a lot of young people being hurt by big people. That might be being hurt by being yelled at, sworn at all the time, dismissed, ignored, neglected. It might be by being hit or watching someone in their family being hit. Um, living with fear, something bad is always going to happen, somebody's going to lose it. Or by being sexually assaulted, especially the young women, but also lots of the young men. It's also, I suppose, a more complex world to grow up in. I, my experience of growing up, and when I look back and look at, at, listen to the young people who come in here, I'm reminded of just how important peers are, how important it is to figure out who you are as a person, that you're worth something, that you have your own unique dream, and that you are a bit more special than everybody else in the world. You know, and if we all think that, that's awesome, you know? And that's a really important developmental. Those of us who are older know that that calms itself down. We work it out. We learn about the voices in our heads that kick us in the ass and tell us off and say, you're too tall, you're too short, you're too fat, you're too thin. We get used to it and we know how to manage it as we get older. Dr Cahoon's consulting room is a treasure trove of objects and knickknacks. He told us how young people respond to the bright colours and toys he decorates the space with. It's sort of an accident, but it's been a happy accident. I want it to have things that make me smile or feel comfortable for me. So I started filling it with toys and books and things I found interesting. What I found really quickly is that young people responded to that. They relax more when they come into the room, I see them relax. And that's good because a lot of talking medicine happens here, or talking is the way to access what they're thinking and where they're struggling most is the way their mind is working and the mind is ganging up on them. Um, we see a lot of the young people because a thought is hurting them. So being able to talk or show what the thought is, is really useful. So comfort, care, love, all those things are massively important. Those soft, cuddly things. All of a sudden there's a little crack of light that you can build a conversation around. A lot of explaining happens here too. It's like this, it's like this. Probably the thing I rely on most is the whiteboard. We're always drawing things and arrows. If you think about thoughts that hurt, it's easy to say this leg saw from here to here, a feel, and it's right there, and it's <laughs> But a thought, how do you do that? But if you can take the thoughts and put them on a table and say, okay, this is what happened with dad. This is what happens at school. This is what happens when you've been drinking. Then you can put them out and you can say which one's the most sore and let's put them in order now. Or you can do that on the board. It takes the unseen and makes it seen. All of a sudden they can see this is why this is sore. If you can own it, if you can see what's happening in your own body, 
you can make sense of what to do next better yourself. I mean, imagination's hugely valuable in medicine. How do I access my sorrow, if not through my imagination? By drawing it up and visualising it, and by starting to de-blob it, because it appears as a blob of black sorrow. How do I, do I call it a dog? Do I call it a dragon? Do I call it George? Do I cuddle it? Do I fight it? Do I chop it into pieces? Do I draw horns on it? You know, silly faces, defuse it. I use my imagination to fight my imagination. The hardest things I see are young people struggling to fight their own thinking. And the imagination is the only thing that gets in there. I can't use a knife. So all we have is love, somebody to hold us, to say it'll be all right, or I'll be here, I'll just wait. I don't know what to do, but I'll wait, and I'll wait, and I'll try again, and I'll probably say something dumb, but I'll ask you how you're doing, and I'll show up again, and I'll try to be there. Commitment, love, relationship, and doing other shit. Saying, oh, I don't know, let's bake a cake, or let's read a book, let's try building a table, um, and just see if we work it out. Sometimes just shaking the thing, and leaving it alone and going off and doing something else. Shake the imagination. People work it out themselves as long as they don't get derailed by addictions and stink boyfriends or girlfriends. Imagination's a massive chapter in the medicine book, if you ask me. But I didn't learn that as a doctor, I learned that as a poet. Um, and it dripped back into my medicine. Being a poet, being a writer, being taught by writing about the importance and the power of a moment and what's held in the pregnancy of a moment intensifies the ability to be comfortable with intimacy, which happens in a consultation. The, these are intimate moments where people are telling you things that have happened to them that, that are really powerful, or they're telling you sadnesses, or worries, or pains. And so poetry teaches you to be able to attend to that and to hold the energy of it. So it's enormously useful, incredibly useful particularly in adolescent medicine, particularly as medicine has become much more about talking than about sewing things back together for me. It's what I call in poetry looking at things with wet eyes. And so if you look at a patient with wet eyes, um, you regard them as an object of beauty. They feel that. And I think there's little bits of medicine shooting into them because human beings are medicine to human beings, I keep saying all the time. There's, there's something in us when we regard each other and hear each other, truly hear each other, and, or make the other person feel understood and heard and listened to, that's enormously powerful. The medicine's in them, but they feel themselves open to it, like a flower. All I know is that in a small town, we listen to big stories. We turn young people away every week who we should see, who it's wrong for us to turn away. But we get so full that it's impossible to see them in any reasonable time frame. And we shake our fists and make lots and lots of noise about trying to open other days and bend over backwards to do that. But, you know, money. Yeah, money and, and poor management systems, not having national strategies around youth medicine and other funding priorities. And that will change depending on the politics of the day. The siloing of healthcare, which turns other organisations like us into competitors because we're competing for the same funding. That, yeah, we could open five days a week and pretty much fill our time up. And I think if you talk to every health service in the country, they'd say the same thing. None of them are saying like, oh no, we're fine. 
we don't need more funding. <laughs> They're all struggling. I've seen after 10 years the power of staying put for 10 years and spending hours and hours and hours with kids and their families over that time period, maintaining conversations. So create a workforce that can do that. Not one that's like, I'm with you for six months and then you're off to another service. Or sorry, you just aged out. I've got your story, but you just turned 19. Sorry. You know, we've had this spiritual human interaction, this tenderness, and now we will rule a line through it. So middle New Zealand can moan all it likes about the CEOs of the ministries and politicians, and I moan more than most about them. But we moan because they're faceless, but that's not fair. It's us. We don't vote for things against our self-interest. Well, I would argue it is our self-interest because that world will interact with your world one day. It'll drive drunk into your kid, you know? It will rob your house. It will cost you a whole lot of tax to look after them in prison. We all pay one way or the other, so best to pay up front. Dr Cahoon discusses the challenges and obstacles he sees in the current system and how they impact the work he's able to do with young people. These are our kids. To look at them like your nephews and nieces. Yeah? To love them. For some of the young people who are hurt, we love them until they start hurting other people. Then we're horrible to them. And we forget that that's one piece of string. And that they grew out of our society. Our body is made of 70 trillion cells or something like that, give or take one or two. And <laughs> those cells don't know that they're Glenn. On one level, those cells are a human being that has a consciousness and a sense of its oneness. And a community's the same. And New Zealand is one organism. On one level, we can look at it like that. And there's an illness in an organ system. And this is our organism as a country. And we are hurting some of our children. We are giving them adverse childhood events and they are growing out of vulnerable families. So somewhere in the heart of New Zealand, we are creating conditions where it's difficult for some families and we're sustaining that. Partly there's, there's a colonization process that's gone through in New Zealand. So it's, it's in its deep structure and we're, we're trying to deal with it, but I don't know that we're fully dealing with it. We need to see ourselves as that's our body. It's not someone else's problem. They're our kids. And something as banal as my safety net is preventing redistribution. Just a little tiny bit of it in tax dollar is preventing redistribution of resource. It takes long-term, committed human relationships, working with vulnerable families, loving them, not judging them, and bringing out in them what they truly want, which is to love their children and to grow them and to, to find love in themselves and a sense of who they are. We're on this crazy world in a big old lonely universe. And I heard a, an astronomer talk about it recently and I thought it was really beautifully put, but we are the universe's way of looking back at itself. We are made of stars. We are evolved with a consciousness to the point where we can look and see universes above us. We don't quite know how it all got patched together. It makes us human to listen. Life is short. It helps us to appreciate who we are. It defines us. It makes us humble. It makes us gentle and tender. And all we have sometimes is to cling to each other. And that's about all the meaning there is to it. And also in the listening is an eternity. There's a place you can find that's eternal. There's this moment of connection this moment of tenderness, 
that is a point in time and forever at the same time. So it's just a really lovely thing to do for yourself.